It's a great pleasure to have Coach Kyle Julius on our show. Coach, how's it going? Things are good. I mean, Roger, you know, a little bit of unfortunate circumstances here for me in Taiwan, having left the Dreamers. But, you know, I'm with my family, uh, spending time with my family, enjoying a little bit of Taiwan here before we go back to the cold in Canada. So, uh, you know, things are good. Okay, first question, Coach. Yeah. It's a tradition on my show to ask who the GOAT is. Okay. So who is your GOAT of Taiwanese basketball? Because you've been in Taiwan for quite a bit yeah. now. So you know a lot about Taiwanese basketball players, right? Yeah, I do. So who would you put at the top? Great question. Uh, when I look at Taiwanese basketball right now, I look at kind of like that golden generation, right? That won those the games playing internationally. And then I also look at right now, you know, some of these younger guys and, you know, in the CBA, there's some very good players. But I think for me, you know, I've coached a few, obviously coached against a few. I'd have to say it, it would be between Tian Lei and Beast for me. Okay. And then when I study and when I look at it, I got to go with Beast. It's an absolutely amazing to play at his age the way he does. When I see the film, I think he played with a greater passion, a greater toughness than most of the Taiwanese. And when I watch him, the first time I saw him kind of shooting and warming up and walking around, he reminded me of like an American or a Canadian. His mannerisms, his, his body language, you know, his form and technique when he shoots. For me, you look at Beast and you look at Gary, two great shooters, outstanding standing shooters, form and technique. But I would give the edge probably to Beast, just that toughness that I saw when he was younger, the passion, his athleticism, ability to get to the rim, make big shots, guard. Uh, I think for me, he's my GOAT. There's no, um, no debate on that. I won't argue with you on that. To carry on with your uh, previous topic about Taiwanese shooting is really bad. Why do you think that is? Is that just not enough practice or are we doing it wrong? Or why do you think that is, coach? If you look at the history, if you go back uh, 15 years of basketball in Taiwan, all these coaches are constantly bringing in Americans that are big guys. They love big guys. They love the biggest player all the time. And then, so what happens is you're not bringing in these great shooters. You're not bringing in these great, you know, North American shooters or European shooters. And so when you bring great players in, it's easy to learn. I just think the style of play in Taiwan has always been so oriented to play through big guys. I think it's always been geared towards, you know, power forwards and having the biggest players that shooting and spacing has never really been like a priority in Taiwan. This is my from my research, what I've gathered. And if you think about the young players constantly watching these pro leagues growing up and the young coaches and the, the high school coaches and the university coaches, I, I'm assuming there's probably never been a, a real emphasis on shooting because the shooting percentages, even in the T1 and the UBA, the colleges and in the P League are really, really low. Like they're bad. You know, like 31 or 32% as a team will lead the league. You can never find a guy in the 40s. You know, look at the league right now all these games are in the 80s all these games are in the 90s like it's really hard to get you know scores in the hundreds it's rare i just think like the shooting really affects everything there must not have been an emphasis on proper form and technique on these young kids you know growing up uh, what about free throws <laughs> Well, I mean, <laughs> yeah, like the free throws are just as bad or yeah, they just are. the shooting? Free throws are probably better because it's easier to make a free throw, obviously, than, you know, than a three pointer if someone's guarding you or whatever. But even the free throw shooting is in the 60s and low 70s, you know, to lead the league. Okay. So I've asked all the easy questions now. Yeah. Now I'm going to get into the real hard ones. Let's do it. So the first one. There's been a lot of gossip and rumors about you not playing the Taiwanese players. Yeah. Or maybe you have beef with certain players, yep. et cetera. And that's why, you know, they didn't get the minutes. And after you left, they started playing a lot. Like, is there any truth to that? Like, what's your side of the story on that? Yeah, I, I got a lot of uh, messages and questions about that. And I think it's interesting because, for example, we were the number one local usage team last year for the entire season. We were the only team team to start one import and rotate our imports and trade our imports off. And now you see Tao Yin doing it this year, but we did that before anybody else last year. We were the only team to truly play five out equal opportunity offense. We were the only team to hit more than 19 threes in a game, like more than once. And our, and our team got so much praise for that. 
Well, to be perfectly honest, I didn't do anything different this year. You know, I know that there's one or two Taiwanese players that I didn't play that much. But, you know, look, I have a system and I have values. And when it comes to getting playing time for me, it has to fit the system and it has to fit the values. There was absolutely no player on our team this year that I chose not to play because I didn't like them or anything along those lines. Everything that I do is based on our my value system as a coach and based on the system that I'm trying to kind of like implement and play with. So for you know people to be very critical of create a rumor like you know I'm not playing a particular player for a certain reason I think it's unfair to the dreamers everything for me was based on the offense spacing and being able to execute my offensive system that I know and trust and I've been doing for many many years so yeah it had nothing to do with players that I liked or didn't like it had everything to do with my value system and practice and then my desire for us to be better offensively so speaking of that then what do you think caused the offensive struggle for you guys this year you know it's very painful because Like I said, we did everything the same as last year. I think we had a very, very good training camp, but I have to take a lot of the responsibility as the coach. I really struggled to connect with a lot of the Taiwanese players this year, and it goes into your first question. It has nothing to do with like or dislike. I'm a very、mm-hmm. specific coach. I have a very specific system. Last year, for example, there's some major differences. So you have a, a healthy Randy Walco, and you have a healthy Doug Creighton. Listen, those two guys are two of the best shooters in the league. Okay, they both have great size. I was really able to execute my system really well, and I was really able to still maintain the defense. From what I know, I was like one of the first coaches in Taiwan. From what I saw, to like really switch everything on defense. And then I thought we did a really good job of that last year, where we added Brandon to the mix. So you know, we were switching even with Brandon, and then we had this great rim protection at the same time. And I thought we were really good at it, and primarily. Randy was a huge factor in that. You know, whenever Randy was on the floor, I had size. I could still switch, and then I had my offensive spacing. Now the next big thing is, you know, when you look at the lineups we had last year, Randy, Doug, Kenny, Jay Chen, you know, they all spoke English. It was very easy、yeah. for me, and like I said. I'm not an easy guy to play for. I'm very, very demanding, especially of the details of my system. So I think、mm-hmm. what happened is this year you lose Randy, you lose Doug. You know we didn't have Doug in, at all in training camp. He only played a little bit. That is a huge, huge, huge loss for not only the execution. But the system itself, where you know Doug would translate, Doug's a leader out there, you know. And then I just think this year with all the new players, I think the new players are great. I think they're smart, and they were smartly added to the team. But there wasn't the same connection, and I think a lot of it had to do with the language barrier. You know, I'd been in Taiwan for a couple of years, and I never really felt the language barrier like I felt it this year. I just did not feel comfortable that they. Understood what I wanted. A lot of my spacing was very different to the players coming from the SBL. You know, so we had lineups this year of only one guy speaking English, whereas last year we would have like our first six or seven guys spoke English, and it was just much easier. So there was a huge disconnect this year, and I have to take responsibility for that. I just probably wasn't patient enough. I probably talked a little bit too much. Probably the film sessions were a little bit too long, you know. And I think I kind of maybe just overcoached the group, and eventually I could really feel that the group wasn't responding. Because I'm all about energy, effort, enthusiasm. I'm all about toughness and grit, and I really felt like that culture that we had built was really slipping away, and I didn't have as the control like I had in the previous seasons. So not having those key players healthy really changed things year over year, right? That's a big piece to it. And then I just think the new players, the language barrier was a problem. And I played guys that I thought fit the system the best that I wanted to run. And my goal was always offensive oriented. Like you know, for me it was like I need to play the best. Five players for offensive spacing, 
Then at the end of the day, we did not shoot the ball well. In the 13 games that I coached, I was really pleased with the shots that we got. I thought we generated great shots. Yeah, like we just really struggled from the three-point line. And so now I'm a coach that, you know, runs offense to get a lot of threes. We space the floor, we play in tempo, and the ball's not going in. The new players, I'm not connecting well with the new players. It was really a struggle. That's some great insight. Thank you so much, coach. Yeah. So the other question I want to ask you now, coach, is Nick Foss. Yep. Why did he just, like, he played one game yeah. and he's gone. Yeah. Again, I have to take responsibility for everything, right, that happens with the team in that direction and, and in that regard, and I do. So just like I was saying, you know, and this is how you know I'm true to my values, I was desperate for the scoring and spacing. I thought that, you know, Brandon was playing really well as a five, but we were not getting the scoring from the perimeter that I thought we really needed. You know, unfortunately, Unfortunately, when Nick came, he was sick. Like he came and he was really under the weather. He was really sick for a while. I really wanted to see him stay with us and play some more. But at the same time, you can't wait. He came and he was really under the weather. Uh, he was not in great shape. And so I think everybody was in agreement, like just to move forward and not wait for him to get into shape was the best thing for the Dreamers. I see. Of all the local players that the Dreamers have right now, who do you think has the uh, brightest future? Well, I think a lot of them do. I've always been- You can only pick one, coach. Only you can pick only pick one. one. The brightest future. Yeah. You know, for me, what makes a great player great, Roger, is work ethic. All these guys are talented, but what makes a great player great is the consistent, like come early, stay late, the ability to stay positive, the ability to consistently make plays and come to the arena with, again, what I call E3 energy, effort and enthusiasm. And I think if you look at that combined with talent, I've got to say that Jay Chen has a very bright future because his work ethic is so special. His energy is so special. Achi for sure has the talent. If Achi worked like Jay Chen, I think he would be hands down the answer. But for me, Jay Chen's passion and his work ethic and his desire to get better, that kid, like you don't have to play him for three games. You throw him in the third quarter of the fourth game and he'll hit two threes for you. Like he's a special kid and a special player. And I, and I, I have a lot of trust and belief in, in him going forward. Coach, you're Canadian, yep. I'm Canadian. I read your uh, bio. I know that you grew up in yep. Ontario, correct? Yep. And now you are living in BC. Yep. So Ontario or BC, which province is better? Ooh, that's tough. <laughs> well, I've never lived in BC, only worked for a period of time. Mm -hmm. My heart will always be in Ontario, but that's a dangerous question. That's a vicious <laughs> question to ask. There is no question that BC is much more beautiful. So better, and I'm gonna say BC. I think BC is a better province. Uh, my heart is in Ontario, but I'll answer your question. I'll, I'll man up. I'll say BC, man. Nice yeah. pick, coach. Well, thank you so much for coming on the show on such a no short notice, coach. And uh, thank you for taking the time to clarify the things that I wanted to clarify with you. And. Um, Sure. For the uh, part two of this interview, everyone, please go watch Hunku's video. Thanks again, coach. You're welcome, Roger. My pleasure, man. Thank you.